Welcome to Amen Podcast. I'm Lokalani, your host, and I'm joined by my husband, Alex, who is preaching about joy as we continue our series in Matthew and study the parable of the hidden treasure. So prepare your hearts and open your Bibles to Matthew 13, 44. I'll go ahead and read. Alex will share his sermon, and then we'll come back around for a question at the end. And if today's episode brings you joy, consider liking, subscribing, rating, reviewing, and donating at amenpodcast.com. We're in the ESV version today. Verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Amen. So we have a a friend of ours that lives next door who comes to our house church ever so often. She's a grandma, great grandma, actually. And we ran into her at the beach not too long ago. And she had just gone on a 25 minute run. I guess her daughter had told her, mom, if you want to keep your heart healthy, just run for 25 minutes. Don't worry about how long you go or, or how fast you go. Just run for 25 minutes. And she did it. And she was she was exhausted, but she looked so proud of herself. She looked so happy. And she told me why she did it. And it's because of her grandkids, because of her daughter. She wants to be around. She wants to see them. Treasure will make you do things that you never thought you would do. Treasure will make you sacrifice so much. And in fact, if you find a great enough treasure, you're willing to sacrifice everything, to give up everything. And what what we're talking about today is the treasure of all treasures, and that is the kingdom of heaven. So we're, we're going to talk about the need for joy, the problem with joy, and the solution for joy. Because if you read Matthew 13, 44, it says that the reason why the, this guy in this parable gives up everything is because his joy. The Bible says in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has to buy that field. Now this parable has been just butchered in so many different ways. And so I studied and studied and studied and I'm so excited to share it here with you um, because I found just the consistencies in just uh, the reformed biblical uh, ex- exegesis of this passage. And, and usually in commentaries, when you find consistencies, you find a group after group, after group, after group of people who say, this is what contextually is going on here. Sometimes when we find the outliers where people get a weird take on a verse, you're like, okay, I don't think that's right. Sometimes it is. Um, it, prayerfully studying matters. Um, but what does Paul tell us? He says, study to show thyself approved. And so that's what I did. I studied hard for this one. Because in the first four of the eight parables in chapter 13, they're all about they're all about the kingdom of God and they're all about uh, people's responses to the kingdom of God. And then in the last couple episodes, the, uh, the disciples are asking Jesus, now that they're alone with Jesus, they've separated from the crowds. They're asking him, what does this all mean? Well, if that is how people respond to the kingdom of heaven, how do we get into the kingdom of heaven? That was the natural next question. And that's what the next four parables answer. This parable is telling us why we need treasure. And that's because we must realize what a treasure the kingdom of heaven is. We're invited to be a part of something that is eternal, not temporal. There's no other opportunity like this on earth. Everything on earth ends except Jesus's kingdom. The promise to David was that one of his descendants would have a kingdom that would never end. That is Jesus's kingdom. That is the kingdom of heaven. We have a place to grow, to invest, to belong, to find purpose, to be loved forever in the kingdom of heaven. If we're a part of this, nothing else matters. It's nothing else matters unless it's connected to this kingdom. Do you understand? And the glory of God. So the treasure of the kingdom of heaven is a treasure of all treasures and everything in life that we encounter and that we treasure is just a small atom compared to the universe of God's goodness. Think about how small an atom is. We can't even see atoms without microscopes compared to the universe. We can't see a universe 
without telescopes. And even we can only see parts of the universe. You have to be drawn out of it to be to look down upon a universe. You have to have a godlike view. That is the difference. Everything you treasure from your job to your coffee to your, you know, going to a hotel for your birthday, like Loke and I are doing right now, to uh, you're seeing your baby being born, whatever it is, working out, um, cars, uh, skateboarding, whatever it is, it is but a small atom compared to the universe of God's goodness. Mm. All treasure points to true treasure. And real treasure doesn't run out. So when it says in chapter 13, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field, what is Jesus saying? Well, back at this time, they would have heard stories about treasure all the time because in antiquity, there was great amount of poverty. And so they would have these fanatical dreams, stories about people finding treasure. Back then, they had this rabbinical law that told them finders keepers. Whatever you found, you could keep. If you found coins, it's yours. Um, so in this story, this guy finds treasure in a field. The reason why is because of marauders, pirates, wars, and no banks. In Matthew 25, there is mention of bankers. That just meant money loaners or money lenders. There was no banks back then. And so if you had rubies, coins, gold, or whatever, you would hide it in the ground in your fields. Now, if marauders and pirates came and took your house, robbed you, the treasure would stay there. If you heard that a, another kingdom was coming, you would dig up your treasure and take it with you. Whatever happened in this story, in this parable, there's field, there's a field and there's treasure in the field and some guy working there, working the field, finds it, he comes across it and it becomes his now. This would have changed his life. And so Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God changes lives like that, but infinitely more. You come across it and it changes you. You need this kind of treasure in your life because you can't get something eternal from, from something temporal. Something that can run out can't bring you joy. Every other treasure runs out. The kingdom of heaven does not run out. It's forever. And something that can run out can't give you joy. It can give you happiness, but it can't give you joy. Now let's get into the problem with joy. If we're gonna get, if the only way to find joy is to find it in treasure that can never end, the problem with that particular kind of treasure is that it's hidden. Verse 44, Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Why is it hidden? It's hidden because the kingdom of heaven is the only kingdom that finds you. Every other kingdom you have to find. It calls you. The kingdom of heaven calls you in, it draws you in, and it's the only kingdom that chooses its own subjects. God in his sovereignty gives us no ability to boast in finding his kingdom. He finds us and invites us in. Think about Narnia. Did Lucy find Narnia or did Narnia find Lucy? She's playing hide and go seek with her siblings. She gets into a wardrobe, she backs up, gets away from the door, she backs up even further, and all of a sudden the, the mothballs start to, you know, it goes from smelling like mothballs to smelling like forests. The robes and the jackets that are in the wardrobe start to feel like Douglas fir trees rubbing against her, you know, arms. Narnia drew her in. Narnia found her. She didn't go out looking. So it is with the kingdom of God. This treasure found the man not the other way around. What well, he was looking in the field. Nope, Jesus does not say that in the parable. In the parable, we see the man's <laughs> surprise. You okay? Mm -hmm. we, see the man, we see the man's excitement in coming across this and then willingness to sell it all, to get it. It found him through God's providence. He drew the man to the treasure. I want you to go to Ephesians 1, 4. Lokilani is going to read this for us. Ephesians 1, 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So Paul tells us, as he's talking to the Ephesian church, this is the problem that uh, we find with joy. The, the joy of a Christian is found in the treasure of the kingdom. 
Now, that particular kingdom is hidden. Why? Because we don't find the kingdom on our own. We can't boast in that. If you lack joy, you have not found the treasure, which means you don't understand that it's hidden. Because if you come across the hidden treasure of the kingdom of God and the fact that God chose you, brought you to the kingdom, there is absolutely no reason to not have joy. If there's nothing that you can do to find the kingdom, in God and his goodness before the foundation of the earth, he says here in Ephesians, chose you in Christ mm -hmm. and drew you to Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. That means you are loved, not because of what you can do, not because of how smart you are, not because of your family, not because of how hard you work, not because of anything performative. You are loved because you are God's. Mm -hmm. That changes everything. That is a reason for joy. We feel happiness when people applaud us for something performative that we do. We feel uh, uh, tickled pink when someone says, I love your outfit. I love what you did with that podcast. That episode was great. That's a, wow, you like me, you thank me, you applaud me for what I did. That feels good, but that goes away. It's temporal, it's not eternal. Joy is eternal. Joy is calm delight. It's non temperamental. That's why it's calm delight. It literally translates into calm delight. Non-temperamental means it doesn't move with the wind. It doesn't move with feelings. It stays constant. It's unsinkability. Tim Keller says it's like a beach ball you push underwater. It pops back up. That is joy. That is eternal. You can only get that if the kingdom of God is hidden because you didn't find it on your own. It was, you were drawn to it. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the earth. That tells us the Trinity wasn't surprised by all this. God had a plan all from the start. It tells us that uh, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, though they are equal, they had different parts in this. And they worked together to draw you to God and to the kingdom. Now, what is the solution? The solution is joy. We kind of said it before, you know, joy um, is, if you don't have joy, then you haven't found the treasure, which means you're not a part of the kingdom. So we have to look at our joy. Now, here's three examples of guys who missed it, people who missed it, and, an ex and one example of someone who has joy and found the treasure. And I'd like to believe, you know, hopefully these guys came around, but the first one is in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. In the gospel of Luke, Jesus sends out 72 disciples. This passage is from when they returned to speak to him about what happened on the mission field. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. So here Jesus sends out the 70 uh, disciples and they go out and they are you know, doing miracles, preaching, teaching, casting out demons. And they come back and they say, even the spirits are subject to our name mm. or subject to our, our power. And Jesus says, you know, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And he says, I've given you power over the demonic realm, but do not rejoice in this. Don't find joy in this, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Mm. They were finding joy in the wrong place. They were missing the treasure because if they had joy, it'd be because of treasure. But they were missing the treasure because they were so focused on their own greatness. They were focused on how, what, how great their ministry was. And they, because of that, they were missing the joy. They were missing the treasure. Jesus says, don't try to find joy in that. Don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's eternal. You won't always encounter uh, possessions and demons that get cast out at a word. There's going to be times where demons don't get cast out. We see that um, right after the transfiguration in the book of Matthew. And Jesus comes down from the transfiguration with, with Peter, James, and John. And these other guys are trying to cast out a demon. And they're like, why couldn't we do it? Jesus says, this kind can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. And so there's going to be times where they struck out. 
So if they're finding joy in that, that's temporal. That's just happiness. It's not real joy. You got to find joy in, in the only place that will give you joy, which is the treasure of the kingdom of heaven, because it's eternal. So weakness should never cause you to lose joy. Lack of strength should never cause you to lose joy. Mm. Weakness is the reason for joy. Mm. Well, I'll explain what I mean, but let's, let's read um, the second example in Luke chapter 1, verse 14. And the reason why the, these 70 disciples um, were missing it is because that's not real joy. It's happiness, they, which explodes whenever we feel strong and look great. But when we don't feel strong, we flip right back into selfishness and anger. That's the problem with finding happiness in our strength, that when we feel strong, we feel happy. But when we don't, we cover it up. And we hide behind selfishness and anger. We flip back to that. And that's why it's not real joy. Because joy is what? Calm delight, non-temperamental delight. Okay, the second example, Luke 1, 14. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. So in this example, uh, this is an example of Zechariah. Zechariah is John the Baptist's dad. He was super old when Gabriel in Luke chapter 1 comes to him. And says, hey, you're going to have a baby. And he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And the angel, Gabriel, says to him, you will have great joy. He says back to him, how can this happen? How shall this be? I don't know. I'm really old. And, he's, and Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And because you doubted, you're going to be mute until the baby comes. And Zechariah was now a priest that couldn't preach. Tragedy. Because why? He missed the treasure. He didn't, have, he didn't have joy. Why was he missing it? He was missing it because he was too busy looking at his weakness. Now, he's, he's the opposite of our first example. The first example missed it because they're looking at their strength. Zechariah missed it because he was looking at his weakness. Mm. Now, back to what I said earlier, weakness should never cause you to lose joy. Weakness is the reason for our joy. If you lose joy when you are weak, you haven't experienced the treasure. Now, why is weakness the reason for our joy. Paul says, when I am weak, I am strong. The more weak you are, the more humble you are. And God gives grace to the humble and opposes the proud who think they're strong. The fact that we're weak means we need a savior, means we've realized that. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So the more weak you are, the more attuned you are to the fact that you are a part of a kingdom that is greater than you and you got in not because of your strength you got in because of your weakness because you couldn't find it he had to come find you you're lost not because god lost you we're lost because of our sin mm -hmm. god doesn't lose stuff mm -hmm. he keeps he's very responsible he keeps care of all the things that are underneath his his reign which is everything and he is a perfect caretaker we're lost because we are the ones that are in sin. Our weakness is a reason to rejoice. It's why we worship. I heard a guy say, when you go outside and it's freezing cold, you put on a jacket. Your jacket doesn't change the weather, but it warms you. That's what worship does. In our weakness, we go out into a cold world and we put on worship like a cloak to warm us in our weakness, to change the way we think. The last example uh, is in Mark 10, 21. Mark 10, 21. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. This is the story of the rich young ruler. And in this story, is, there's a little bit, little bit of a different reason why he missed the treasure. Again, the first guy, the first group missed it because they're looking at their strength. The second one missed it because they're looking at their weakness. The rich young ruler misses it because he was looking at his earthly treasure. We're focused on the wrong things. You know, he missed it because he was, was asking himself, what is treasure? But he answered wrongly. He thought treasure was earthly. But what does it say? It's so beautiful that, that Mark puts this in here because... Uh, it's not in some of the other accounts on this story. Um, I think Mark is the only one that mentions this part. He says, but Jesus looking at him, loved him. That's the treasure. Mm. 
Even though this man was self-righteous, even though he was in his sin, he loved them. He loved him. He loved this young man. Jesus loved the 70 disciples. Jesus loved Zechariah. Jesus loves you. He loves us. That's the treasure. Despite our, despite our weakness, despite our pride, despite our misplaced treasure, he loves us. If he really saw that, he'd be willing to give up everything. Isn't that what Jesus invited him to do? In Mark chapter 10, he says, one thing you lack, give up everything and come follow me. And the Bible says he walked away sad, sorrowful. Why? He missed the treasure. He thought the treasure was elsewhere. The treasure is in that, is that God loves you. If you're not all in, you haven't found the treasure. The treasure is that Jesus gave up everything for you, to get you. In one of the commentaries, it said this, when we recognize fully the value of life and the presence of the Savior now and life eternal, all the sacrifice we make cannot compare to the joy of experiencing its present reality. There's nothing that is not worth giving up. If you really recognize that we stand in the presence of God right now, and we will forever. This is what Gabriel says to Zechariah. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Don't you get it? How much joy you should have, Zechariah? That your son is going to be the forerunner of the Messiah? Don't you get it? I, st I know joy. I stand in the presence of God. I'm telling you, you should have joy right now. And so he gets punished because of that. And we will be punished too if we're joyless. Because joyless means you don't see the treasure. The treasure is we get to stand in the presence of God. Only those who love God get to stand in his presence guiltless, righteous in his eyes. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What did Jesus not have? before the cross, a wife, but the church on the cross, he redeemed her on the cross. He saved you and I. So if, if, if he got, if, if something was added to him, if he got, if he got something after the cross that he didn't have before the cross, that means what did he get out of the cross? You and I the church. He saved her for the glory of God so that God would be glorified in his, in his perfect will, in his perfect plan, in his sovereignty, in his just creative direction and power throughout all this, that all of creation would point to say, wow, look at what God did. Jesus got you and I for the joy that was set before him. We are a part of that joy. You are a part of that joy. That is the treasure. This is what we have to realize. Jesus gave up everything for the church. Saving you was his joy. This is what Paul got. Philippians 3, 7 through 8. Paul understood this. This is the example of somebody who had this joy, who got it. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul says everything I consider it as loss. It's, uh, this word loss means detriment, damage, rubbish, trash. In comparison to knowing God, even the greatest things I've suffered or the greatest things I've victored. I don't think that's a word. The greatest things I've conquered. It's all trash. It's all empty compared to knowing Jesus. He gets it. I mean, he gets it. This is someone on his worst day is able to tell himself, but God loves me. On his best day, on his most performative excellence day, winning the Super Bowl, becoming president, whatever it is, on that day, he can say, yeah, this is all great, but God loves me. 
What this man in this parable is saying is he's, he's showing us how to live with complete abandon. Then in his joy, he goes and he sells all he has to buy this field. How do you do this? Knowing Jesus's love. That's what this treasure represents. Knowing that love, you won't be affected by money, status, self-esteem, power. This is the question we have to ask ourselves. Do you have joy? And if so, what have you given up? Do you really have joy? And if so, what have you given up? This man in the parable, what he's saying is this. He's saying, don't you know what this means? I am set. Nothing else matters. I am set for life. My life is will never be the same. Don't you understand? That's what he's telling himself. That's why he's willing to cover up that treasure and run back, sell everything and come back and get it. Don't overcomplicate this parable. It's very simple. There's a lot of like crazy like interpretations of it. There's a main point, maybe one or two points in Jesus's parables. That's the main point. And the main point of this parable is the joy that this man had in finding the treasure of the kingdom. Do you have that joy? If not, you have to look at the cross. That is Jesus doing in a way what this man did. What did he do? He found and then he gave up everything to get it. Is that not what Christ did for us? We are his lost sheep, his lost coin, his lost son that he found and gave up everything to get us. Paid, laid down his life, paid with his blood to give us, took the wrath of God, the punishment of sin to get you. Amen. The more you look at that, the more you'll have joy. And in that joy, it'll be easy to give up. It won't even be, it won't even feel like a sacrifice. It'll feel easy because you're getting something so much greater. This guy didn't feel like he was losing the end of the bargain by giving up his whatever. It could be lust, it could be pride, it could be, you know, addiction, it could be busy schedule, could be a big job, whatever it is. He didn't feel like he was losing anything, relationship, whatever it is that he gave up. He didn't feel like he was losing. He felt like he was gaining. Amen. So do you have joy? And if so, what have you given up? Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this message, this encouragement of your love for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is a part of the episode called After the Amen, where we ask you a question to help you apply this message to your life. And the question today is, do you have joy? If so, what have you given up? Do you have joy? If so, what have you given up? And I'll answer first as always. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have that unsinkable joy. Um, Christ has just opened up my eyes to the fact that life is fleeting um, here on earth and the only treasure I have is in Christ. And so, um, yes, I do have joy, but I think that things try to steal that joy or um, distract us from choosing to believe um, that that is everything that we need, that 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 joy is all that we need. Um, and so, yeah, I think for me personally, uh, what I've had to give up is like earthly security. Um, I think it's so easy to want to store up your treasure on earth or to create something here on earth that we cannot take with us. And that doesn't mean be irresponsible with life on earth or, um, don't invest into life here on earth, but we can put our hope and our joy solely in those things. And we can completely miss um, not only spending eternity with Christ, but also just the joy of having an abundant life now in him, this unsinkability when things don't go our way um, and the opportunity to share this joy with others when we are so focused on the here and now and building something here on earth that we can't take with us. And, um, one of the like first books of the Bible I read as a Christian was Ecclesiastes and everyone's like, yeah, this is the depressing book. And I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> am I missing something here? Because to me, it was so freeing. It's like, yes, okay. I feel like, I mean, I didn't go as far as Solomon went, but like, I feel like in some aspect, you know, I've tried everything to, to receive joy, to receive whatever it is that I'm supposed to find from the purpose of life. 
and it's all fleeting. It's all meaningless. It all means nothing. And the only thing that we can place our hope in and our security in is in Christ alone. And to know that we don't have to have attachment to the world is just such a freeing thing. And I think it allows us to live more freely in the here and now. Um, and so I saw like this quote and it says, I am I am homesick for a home I have yet to create. And I was like, oh, that's so true. Like, I think just as a wife and a mother, like I have longings for like the home I want to create, whether it's physically like what I want in the home or just the environment that I want to create in my home. And if I spend too much time thinking on that throughout the day, because, you know, with whatever it's trendy right now to be like a homemaker homesteader have a farm like have all these things because it is a simpler way of life because it is um kind of getting back to our roots um and living in a more traditional biblical way so those are great things but it's so easy to be like well I don't have a farm or I don't know how to make this homemade yet I don't know how to do this I don't have meat cow like I don't have uh fresh meat available for me and I can place my hope there and I can completely lose the joy that I need to create the environment for my family in the home that I have right now. And, um, you know, I can work towards a better way of life here on earth and that's fine, but my security and my hope can be in the fact that I have citizenship in heaven, that Christ has already created a place for me and for my children. And that's why the most important thing is not that I'm making homemade bread or whatever, homemade butter, but like the most important thing is that I'm passing the faith along to them. And if I don't have joy, they're going to be like, how they, she's always talking about Jesus. They have a podcast about Jesus, but she's like always stressed out and like, you know, worried about food or worried about like the furniture or whatever in the house or that I'm have muddy feet and like, it's not worth it. She doesn't, it doesn't seem like this whole, like that she really thinks Jesus is enough. You know, if I'm frantic, if I am joyless, if I'm consumed and worried about things on earth. And so, um, yeah, I think that a lot of the decisions that we've had to make is to like, okay, we're not going to store up our treasures here on earth. And that means we aren't going to have all the things that we wish that we could have here on earth to make our life more comfortable or to make us feel more secure in our life here, especially with a lot of children. But that's okay. And because we have everything that we need in Christ and we trust his promises that he will always provide for us, that he will always supply our every need, that he will not forsake us, that he, he, our seed will never beg for bread, you know. Um, those are his promises and we can trust in them. So, yeah, that's so good. That's a very refreshing reminder that life is just so short and it makes no sense to just use all your time seeking treasure that is not going to go with us. And, um, when we have treasure eternal and available to us and, and in seeking that earthly treasure here, we could end up missing heavenly treasure, yeah. the kingdom of God. Yeah. And like, I just thought that was just super good that you said that. Yeah. And I think, does it mean you need to run around with a smile on your face? No. Yeah. Does it mean like you need to be fake when you don't feel happy, when you don't feel excited? Do you have to fake that? No. I think the kingdom of God gives is one of the safest places. The church should be one of the safest places where you can just feel what you need to feel, yeah. you know, like, and not have to fake it. But what 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 it doesn't mean is it means you don't snap. Right. It means you don't just like massively break down because of that calm delight. Mm -hmm. You're just you're calm. You know, it doesn't there isn't like huge, weird peaks and valleys right. of you just like completely going off the spectrum and losing it. It's going to be ups and downs. Mm -hmm. But calm delight is what we're talking about here. If you're just flipping out, mm -hmm. you know, from time to time. There's a person who knows that the God of the universe, the same person that made penguins and apple trees, loves you, not because of what you can do, but because you belong to him. That should keep you pretty calm, that you will stand in the presence of God now and forever. That should keep you calm, even on your worst days, even on your best days. It's beautiful. Amen.
Amen. So let us know the answer to this question. Do you have joy? And if so, what have you given up? And we love you so much. Coming at you from Kauai, Hawaii, and amenpodcast.com. Rate, review, support, like, all that. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Yes, until then, go out and be the church. Amen.